present this uh, case uh, and uh, we'll go there in a little bit. And I want to thank my uh, colleagues, uh, <coughs> Selvi and Sylvia who've joined and also Roy, Sriram and Ravi. And I want to thank uh, the support of uh, John Stroline, my mentor, Mr. Charles Butt, uh, and the HEB grant, uh, Ms. Angela Deal for their illustration and my institution. So this is uh, actually, it's a, uh, this is a 60 year old woman, actually. She was referred for endoscopic resection of a, a large polyp. And uh, what happened was uh, uh, she moved from uh, the Carolinas to Texas. Uh, and uh, she had a colonoscopy in 2012, uh, but she doesn't remember you know, what, uh, what happened then. Uh, one of the things is she recalls that she had a polyp. And uh, uh, this time uh, she had a procedure in December. Uh, a 50 millimeter carpet-like polyp was uh, found in the ascending colon and it was partially removed by uh, EMR. And the endoscopist uh, makes a note, it was too large to be completely excised. And uh, he also underestimated the size. So uh, he did not resect it completely. And uh, he also mentions that the central area did not lift uh, despite using uh, three different uh, snares to cut it. So he tried hard and uh, uh, it was not successful. The pathology came back as tubular adenoma. And uh, uh, that's the reason why we saw this uh, patient. So here are the pictures actually. Uh, he removed a few other small polyps and this was the ascending column polyp. Uh, here, and uh, this was after saline injection with methylene blue, and this was a resection, and then he put a little bit of tattoo and sent it. So uh, at this point, uh, why don't I ask uh, uh, Selvi and Sylvia to comment on this? And uh, when you see this thing in your clinic, uh, what goes on in your mind and how do you figure out what to do next? And Roy actually joined, so I'll ask Roy to comment as well. Okay. Should I start? Yeah, please. Um, I will um, focus on the most um, relevant lesion, the um, uh, lesion in the ascending colon, which looks uh, to me as a laterally spreading tumor. And uh, just to apply the ACE um, algorithm, Professor, Professor uh, Sutikno described recently uh, together with a group of um, international um, experts. So if we look to the appearance, we don't see any concerning features. Uh, there is, uh, in my opinion, no converging. I don't see converging folds. I don't see uh, depressed area, nodular area, or or uh, irregular surface uh, or expansion. Um, so examination in white light uh, does not show any concerning features. The second step would be classification, which allows us to stratify the risk um, of containing submucosal invasion. And in my opinion, this is a laterally spreading tumor of granular homogeneous subtype um, with um, a diameter of about, yes, maybe four centimeter. It's um, not yet two quadrants over two quadrants. It's four or five centimeter. And we know the location already. And uh, the risk of submucosal invasion in these lesions is very low, less than 1%. And the next step would be to examine uh, the lesion with enhanced endoscopy in order to confirm uh, diagnosis. 
to exclude areas of invasion. So I think the risk is very low to contain submucosal invasion. So this lesion could be resected by um, EMR. Also, piecemeal EMR is a good option in this case. Okay. Selvi? Uh, sure, Raju. So uh, excellent uh, discussion by Sylvia, as always. Um, I think it's important to, um, just in terms of planning, I'm glad we're seeing the patient in clinic beforehand, and they're not just showing up uh, on our endoscopy schedule. Um, we know that this lesion has been previously manipulated, so we can plan for um, a prolonged procedure um, because there may be some, some mucosal tethering from where previous manipulations have happened. Um, it'll be important to review the pathology from before. Um, it'll also be important to evaluate the patient, make sure they're not on any blood thinners, uh, whether they're local or not, um, what uh, other plans they have for uh, the time after the procedure, what concerns they have, um, if they, um, uh, I, I think uh, those are some of the things that I would be, uh, th that are going through my mind. Okay, thank you, thank you. Roy, any thoughts you want to add? Looking at these pictures, uh, it is uh, truly unfortunate uh, that uh, the resection uh, was probably incomplete the first time around. And the second time around, uh, it showed that, uh, that it was already tethered. And then uh, again, uh, a resection that's uh, showing a massive uh, residual that uh, the subsequent outcome could be predicted that this uh, lesion would grow at least the same size, if not bigger, and uh, it will be tethered and it would be uh, quite difficult to remove. The saving grace here is that uh, it is a uh, LST granular homogeneous, so that the risk is uh, is uh, very low. So you can uh, slowly uh, try to cut it uh, and uh, perhaps use uh, APC to uh, coagulate the base. Uh, but this is uh, one thing that one should not perform during an EMR. If you cannot complete the job, uh, let somebody else do it because otherwise this patient. Uh, uh, could end up with a uh, with surgery. Okay, thank you. All right. So this is the uh, one thing is you want to keep in mind is when you see a lesion like that, you expect that the procedure will be quite long, and you don't want to start your day uh, with that procedure and have several cases uh, because you will be stuck you know, um, uh, trying to take care of this patient and as well as try to manage uh, the rest of the schedule. Uh, so when you have a patient like this and you see them in your clinic, try to schedule them at the, uh, as a only case for, uh, for that day, or if you cannot afford that, uh, maybe towards the end of your schedule uh, so that uh, you could uh, take whatever time it takes to resect the lesion. And uh, I think uh, you have to be prepared that this is going to be a very long case. Uh, if it was not, if we, this is a lesion that comes uh, straight to you without prior attempt, uh, this could be cut in probably 30 minutes, uh, but you will see. The reason I put on the bottom uh, time, you know, as the uh, procedure went, I. Uh, put the time at different phases of the resection so that you get a feel for that. So why don't I ask Roy to comment as this video is going. Um, the lesion is uh, like what we had described before. It is an LST granular homogeneous it has uh, evidence of uh, tethering on the side. And overall, the entire lesion looks tethered. Uh, could this be a cut? Yes, uh, it could be cut if you have the right snare, uh, the time, uh, the, the staff to help you. 
uh, the the NBI uh, was brief, but uh, it didn't show any areas that uh, ha has uh, effacement. So this is a benign lesion. Uh, this uh, on this view, you can see the the scar on the edges there, mm -hmm. and uh, you, you know, I think uh, as the endoscopist uh, doing the job. Uh, you may feel like at this time that you're just being uh, given the share of the blame if, uh, if it's not uh, able to be uh, uh, cut uh, or has a bad outcome. And it's uh, really a little bit unfair to the uh, person on the receiving end because this is uh, going to be a, a, a complex cut. So you're right. Actually, one thing is when you are cutting a polyp that has been previously cut, right? You want to spend time to figure out where the scar tissue is. And you want to stay away from the scar tissue with your first injection. If you look at it here, the scar is almost like a U-shape, right? On the uh, anal half of the lesion or the distal half of the lesion. So you want to stay, if you start injecting here, you will not inject, uh, it will be non-lift, or you will create a mucosal blab, and then you will probably uh, back off. So, so uh, just for the sake of her, uh, the trainees here and uh, anybody interested in uh, taking care of these polyps. Uh, I actually put in this uh, a reference. So this is a beautiful reference that just came out uh, just uh, last year. It talks about a lot of different techniques used and then we'll discuss one technique that we used here. Okay, so this is what we did. You know, we tried to uh, decompress the colon a little bit and went towards the appendiceal side of the lesion uh, and then start injecting saline uh, with a little bit of uh, methylene blue and uh, try to lift. Uh, and uh, it was a reasonable lift. And uh, as you will see here, uh, the injection was going slow and then we are trying to get uh, as much lift as possible and uh, realizing that this portion is not lifting. And as you can see, this is a, uh, like a jet coming out uh, because of a fibrosis. So, so in terms of the cut, uh, uh, Roy, what type of snare would you use and how do you go about it? And uh, let me show I, you here. I think you should just use the, the stiff snare. Uh, yeah. So the, the braided snare. And uh, you're going to cut uh, not big, but uh, just small. Right, right. So you're right. And uh, I'm glad that you pointed out having a stiff snare, braided snare. Uh, so this is a stiff braided snare. And uh, we picked a 10 millimeter snare. And as you can see, despite the lift, as we are closing, uh, about a fourth of the polyp actually slipped out of the snare. And uh, uh, so we used a, an endocut Q, uh, effect three, uh, duration uh, one, uh, interval three. Uh, that was the endocut Q313 setting. And then we, uh, cut it and the cut went well. And then we felt that we needed to inject a little more. Uh, so you can see here. Uh, again, along the rim, uh, that uh, polyp is stuck. Although there was a nice lift here. Uh, and then you also want to make sure that uh, you have enough lift. Mm -hmm. As you can see here, it is stuck here again from the scarring from the previous one. And then we thought, okay, let's uh, try and see if we can cut that portion. 
and uh, I think the audience may may think, uh, why couldn't you cut bigger? Uh, this is the the time uh, that you actually uh, cannot cut bigger and you do not want to cut bigger. Uh, you see the the fibrosis uh, after each cut, uh, and uh, also uh, you uh, have this uh, false sensation that uh, the lesion looks like it is lifting, but uh, after uh, uh, the duration of the lift after an injection is actually shorter uh, than uh, if it was a native uh, lesion. Uh, it's like it has a rubber band in the submucosa to pull it back. Mm. And the maximum amount that you can cut at a time is really what uh, Raju is showing. The last thing I wanted to just comment is that uh, uh, Raju is uh, showing that he's uh, comfortably injecting uh, within the lesion and it's necessary to do that. Uh, but uh, you could only do this after you have ensured that there is no uh, possibility or there's a strong unlikelihood that there is high-grade dysplasia or uh, invasion. Uh, so here uh, he had a look at it uh, using the ACE classification and he feels comfortable that there is no uh, possible, no, it's so unlikely that this is um, anything uh, other than uh, just an adenoma. Uh, but if there is any possibility that there is effacement or anything, I wouldn't inject on, on that side. Right. So one of the things I want you to focus here is uh, I'm uh, stopping the video and then replaying. Uh, after injection, I wanted to loosen the submucosa by applying a little bit of suction because I have a cap, see? I try to suction to see if I can loosen the submucosa. Sometimes I've tried using that. Uh, sometimes it helps. So to just uh, make that point, uh, like Roy commented, okay, even though we injected, uh, it tends to uh, flatten very quickly. And uh, uh, you need to have an assistant who can actually work with you in closing the snare at a very slow pace. And uh, uh, when you're dealing with a polyp that is stuck to the wall, uh, whatever you grasp, you try to cut uh, rather than trying to go and see if you can get a bigger piece because this is going to be very difficult in uh, uh, achieving larger pieces of resection because the polyp tends to slip out and you will see my struggle here. Uh, so for the purpose of uh, teaching, I basically let it play without much editing uh, so that you see uh, actually what was happening, right? You know. So uh, in order to avoid the mucosal bridges, I just reopened and tried to get underneath uh, the, uh, the previous cut uh, so as to get uh, some more uh, uh, less issues for me down the road in clearing the bridges. So, So Raju, you're trying to remove this section and it doesn't look like it's been injected. So you're right, you're, you're right. Uh, I was trying to see if I can get to that uh, other edge, right? So mm -hmm. you will see whatever I was trying to do, uh, I'm not able to get, uh, uh, get much uh, mm -hmm. grasp. You see that, mm -hmm. uh, you, mm -hmm. you notice that, you know. Uh, May I have a comment to uh, Professor Raju? Yes, please. Yeah. There is um, an interesting uh, study from Japan showing there is a um, histological distinction between um, uh, the laterally spreading tumors of granular versus uh, non-granular uh, type, which explain why the granular uh, subtype is easier to lift than the non-granular. It's not only the fibrosis, 
they, uh, they suggested in a very elegant study, they uh, found that the muscularis mucosa um, underneath in, in uh, laterally spreading tumors granular, homogeneous, is, uh, is wavy and easy when we inject, it's easy to lift the lesion. And in contrast, in uh, non-granular lesions, the muscularis mucosa seems to be flat. So when we inject, the fluid will, um, will be dispersed. So um, the risk of non-lifting sign in non-granular subtype is higher. Yes, I think that is the most frustrating thing when you're cutting the uh, non-granular tumors because they don't lift and they become uh, uh, like uh, Roy describes it like a more like a pancake, right? You know, you don't they don't have the dome that allows you to cut. So you, you could see that, uh, and, and I put thirty minutes here uh, because uh, they took about thirty minutes into the procedure trying to. Uh, cut this polyp, uh, and uh, you you see me that uh, my snare keeps on uh, slipping without grasping the tissue, and uh, uh, sometimes you wonder at this moment, you know, should you back off, right? Uh, because removing the rest of the polyp by using a hot biopsy avulsion or some other form will take a long time. Uh, but the fact that, you know, this looked benign and uh, if we were able to cut it, uh, you know, here what I did was I decomposed the column, tried to use uh, something similar to water immersion technique uh, that uh, Ken Bermuller came up with uh, that, uh, as a concept. And uh, even then, uh, it didn't make much difference because this polyp, is uh, tethered and there's nothing that allows this polyp to float up uh, because it is uh, tethered to the underlying uh, muscular wall uh, from extensive scarring. So we, we tried the different techniques, you know, we injected, we tried to apply suction, we tried to apply water immersion technique, we tried to use the smallest snare, we tried to uh, uh, use uh, anchoring to do this. And uh, for the sake of trainees and others, you know, this patient was under general anesthesia. And uh, you can see that uh, there was a, the field was stable, you know. Uh, uh, the patient's colon is not moving all over the uh, place. So that is very important when you're doing a resection that is very difficult. Uh, make sure that you put the patient under general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation. And maybe you should talk to the anesthesiologist or the CRNA uh, and uh, inform them that they may need to do whatever, that is paralyze the patient, put the patient on low tidal volume uh, so that your colon is uh, operating field is stable. So you can see that we are trying different uh, uh, ways to cut it and uh, uh, still struggling, uh, as you can see that, you know. Yeah, I wanted to show you that, okay, it's not that, uh, you know, all polyprosections are straightforward, and especially as you all commented. So, so at this time, it, we're already 30 minutes into the procedure, and then we decided that maybe we should use a heart biopsy avulsion. So uh, one of the things that I try to do is you see this uh, area here, right? Going like this. So what I try to do is try to see if I can cut around a particular chunk of uh, tissue to create an island. And that island would be, hoping that that island would be amenable for snare resection. That way at least uh, your uh, procedure will be shorter. You know, instead of trying to take uh, one grain at a time or one grain of uh, tissue at a time. And uh, the other thing is you can see there is a little bit of a cross burn here as I'm doing the APC, uh, doing the heart biopsy evolution. That is something that you should be careful about. Uh, so we use the endocut uh, eye 
and it is a cut current, uh, unlike the uh, uh, unlike the uh, heart biopsy that we use for polypectomy, where we use a, a coagulation current. Uh, so this is a heart biopsy evolution using a pure uh, cut, that is endocut uh, eye. And uh, I prefer to use endocut eye uh, effect one that has no coagulation effect at all. Effect two has some coagulation. And uh, so I use effect one so that it is a pure, pure cut. And I keep my duration at least uh, three or four seconds uh, so that uh, there is a longer duration of cut and I keep the interval. Uh, you can keep the interval wherever you want. It doesn't really matter. So, so now that we created a, a nice island, now we wanted to see if we can actually cut it with a snare. And uh, uh, sometimes it works. Uh, it may, if, if the polyp uh, is not tethered too much, you can be ab able to get underneath that uh, uh, area and then try to close. You need to have a small snare. You cannot go with a 15 or a 20 millimeter snare. I wish they make like a five millimeter snare for these types of polyps. So, so you see that we're trying to get there and uh, again, it's uh, still tethered. So it uh, really did not work as I anticipated. And then I, I went back to hot biopsy evolution and trying to uh, go back picking at it uh, one piece at a time. So the key with hot biopsy evolution is that you want to grasp the tissue and uh, pull the tissue back and then tap on the yellow petal. Uh, you just tap, tap, and then it will dissect uh, the tissue below that and will be able to provide you with a much cleaner cut. Right. So Roy, any comments on that? It's uh, risky. It is risky. Um, I think the one comment I wanted to say is that uh, uh, the, the non-lifting sign uh, has really two components. Uh, number one is that uh, when the lesion really cannot lift. And number two is that uh, if the lesion appeared to lift, but you actually cannot uh, capture it uh, using a snare, just like in this leash, in this case. Uh, there's an illusion that it lifted, but uh, you can see that there is no fluid that's uh, underneath the, the scarred area. They're all right. white. Right. And right. That's, uh, that's another non-lifting sign. See how thick the fibrosis is? It's like amazing. <laughs> you, know, this, uh, you know, this is a lesion that will be very hard for an ESD guy to cut because he will have no plane to cut and easily can get uh, into much, uh, you can get into problems with the perforation, probably lots of perforations uh, when you try to do that with ESD because it's not a small area of fibrosis. So a small area of fibrosis, they will be able to figure out a way to cut around. But when you have a large segment, then it becomes very difficult. And uh, I think, uh, uh, heart biopsy evolution does help in those uh, situations. Uh, here, as I was cutting here, I saw this white structure. One of the things that we don't really, uh, uh, people who do EMR don't realize vessels, while people who do ESD are always looking for vessels and coagulating it. And as you can see here, I saw this and I didn't want to get into trouble uh, by leaving it alone uh, because uh, there's already some damage to the wall, uh, probably will get into trouble with delayed bleeding. Uh, and I thought that I should uh, take time and uh, coagulate that uh, vessel. Uh, one thing you don't want to do is pick that vessel with the heart biopsy 
and then get into a big bleed there. Uh, so we use a hot bar, we use the coagulation grasping forceps and uh, applied a soft coagulation, uh, effect 480 uh, watts uh, to at least uh, coagulate that uh, vessel. Uh, that actually, that vessel actually bo bothered me uh, to the fact, uh, to the point that I should uh, treat that. I see Ravi here. Ravi, any comments? Joseph? No, it looks like a very uh, difficult case. Very difficult. Right. So it's all right. You know, I think it's good to see this and. Uh, uh, okay, so we went back because this edge is uh, still has a lot of uh, 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 polyp tissue there. Uh, you don't want to bail out by trying to ablate with APC when you have visible uh, tumor. Uh, uh, the reason is when you have visible tumor and you ablate it, it is going to come back. You will have a very high recurrence rate. So you want to strip uh, as much of the all the visible tumor with either a heart biopsy avulsion or a core biopsy avulsion. Uh, I prefer heart biopsy avulsion because uh, with core biopsy, every time you take a, a piece, it's going to bleed. And then you don't know what is normal tissue and what is a uh, abnormal tissue. So I prefer heart biopsy and try to go slow. Uh, only thing is, as you have seen, I've taken precautions not to get into trouble with a cross burn uh, because the tip of the biopsy forceps is not insulated. Mm -hmm. So now it took about 80 minutes uh, by the time mm -hmm. we reached here. And uh, uh, this is what it is uh, by the end of uh, multiple piece re piecemeal resections and uh, uh, heart biopsy avulsion. Uh, so you want to take time and examine whatever you've done to figure out uh, if there's any other area that you need to treat. So... Roy, any comments? It looks okay now. Uh, the edges are still not clean though. Right, right, right. So, so you need to out. like clean that up. Right. It will take a long time. Right. So, so we thought that, okay, uh, we got uh, enough uh, uh, work done and we decided to do uh, ablation. And as you can see here, my goal for ablation is to achieve like a brown effect, almost like a, uh, that would uh, look like almost a little bit charred. And uh, my settings are the same, although in the literature people use different settings from 30 to 50 or 55 watts, uh, anywhere from one to uh, 1.5 liters of flow. Uh, to me, the way I look at it is when it comes to ablation, it is not necessarily just about the settings. It is about the tissue effect that you create. And if you say, I'm going to get a lot more burn, um, brown effect, uh, you know that it's not just the current or the energy you deliver, but the duration of the energy that you deliver. That has a lot of uh, impact. So... I work very slowly. I use a host APC, and that's what I've been using all along. And then uh, tap tap uh, one point at a time and looking at the tissue. And uh, I'm actually creating a lot more brown effect in the area where we actually uh, did a lot, lot of uh, heart biopsy evolution uh, because uh, one would expect if recurrence were to happen, Mm -hmm. That's the area where you'd have recurrence, not where you cut it with a snare. So as you can see here, uh, we are slowly going millimeter by millimeter to create ablation. 
And uh, this is only possible if you have a stable operating field. And you may be wondering why I'm repeating that again and again, uh, because traditionally we endoscopists uh, keep thinking that, okay, this is another colonoscopy. Uh, we can do it with uh, uh, maybe uh, total intravenous anesthesia, but uh, depending upon the patient, some patients may breathe deeply up and down, up and down, and that might create a, a field that is moving up and down and you have to coordinate with that. Uh, this is an uh, unedited segment of video. As you can see here, you have a stable operating field just because the patient was under general anesthesia paralyzed. So, so uh, Ju, is, uh, yeah. Why don't you use the tip of the snare and uh, save some money for MD Anderson? <laughs> Can you explain the rationale? I don't want to go in there. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you why I didn't use the tip of the snare. Uh, the reason I didn't use the tip of the snare is because uh, this is a lady that uh, is at very high risk for recurrence. And uh, you know, my own experience has been for the last 10 years using APC, you, you, get, you have very good outcomes when you can create a, a brown effect, although there's no control trial between APC and soft uh, snare tip soft coagulation, I wanted to achieve the tissue effect that I wanted to see. I'm not sure that I could achieve that with this snare tip. So that's the reason to give an explanation. So. So now you go back and see where are the areas that you want to treat and uh, keep on treating. That's what it is about, you know. Uh, Joseph, any comments? Hi, Dr. Raju. Oh, yeah, no, that I just, uh, uh, you said exactly what I was going to say. Well, you know, in terms of APC versus uh, snare tip soft coag, uh, no head to head trials, obviously. I think one, to, of course, depends on uh, your comfort level and your own practice, but also, um, you know, what, what you're able, in terms of um, the positioning, uh, what you're able to, uh, you know, uh, access in terms of, uh, I, I feel like with APC, um, you're, uh, I feel like you're able to, uh, you know, if, with a straight, straight fire uh, APC, you're probably going to be able to uh, get a good um, aim with uh, the edges. Um, STSC uh, again. I, it's not. It's not a matter of cost. I think it's just a matter of what, what your comfort level is. One problem is with this uh, snail tips heart coagulation. I think it works well uh, when you are dealing with maybe a, uh, a straightforward resection when you're looking at uh, ablating the edge. But when you have this much work done to remove. Uh, you know, piece by piece with heart biopsy avulsion, you don't know uh, where to treat, but with APC, you'll probably get a little more, you know. Unfortunately, we don't have a trial, but, uh, but it's also important for people to keep in mind, you know, you can have all the trials, but the trial data does not really apply in your own hands. You have to keep track of what you're doing uh, in your own practice, and, and that's what you should share with the patient. You know, what is it that's happening in your practice with your own team? Uh, that's very, very important. Uh, quoting somebody else's data doesn't mean much to the patient because there's a change in the team there. Sylvia, any thoughts on that? No comments, no, no more comments. Okay. So this, you... uh, go ahead. There was a question in the chat about uh, whether it was worth considering a full thickness resection device in these cases where you expect to see a lot of fibrosis. Right. So a full thickness resection device will, uh, the one that is based on the OTSC, it works when the size of the uh, uh, lesion is uh, about the size of the cap of an OTSC. It's about 10, 12 millimeters, right? Beyond that, it's going to be very hard to really uh, resect. Uh, for a smaller area, you can think about that. If this lesion comes back and we cannot treat it anymore, 
uh, that's the time you could consider uh, a full thickness resection. And not when uh, you have this extensive area. So that is something to keep in mind. So if you ask me, okay, what would you do if this lesion comes back? Uh, if this lesion comes back, I will again try to peel it off and APC. And, uh, and then if it comes back again, if it is very small, then you could consider full thickness resection. Uh, it depends upon how much is the size. I think it's a good question. Uh, I strongly encourage you to read that article that came in GI endoscopy last year that I put the reference there. Um, and there's a lot of uh, interesting material that we will benefit from. Okay. So this uh, patient is about, uh, so by this time it took about uh, 120 minutes uh, to come here uh, to resect this lesion. Uh, and uh, this patient is coming from about uh, two hours uh, away from uh, MD Anderson. And uh, I would have asked her to stay in town and uh, given the fact that there was no bleeding and there was no deep cut uh, and the patient wanted to go home, I felt that we should let her go home, but uh, we should uh, try to close the defect. And I want to show you how we close the defect. So we saw this technique last time uh, that is uh, applying the uh, clip into the submucosa to make that wound smaller. So I use the same technique. Uh, uh, picked a, a wide wingspan clip here and uh, try to go one below the other, but giving a little bit of a gap in between. And that gap would allow you to bring the mucosa to mucosa later on. So you want to uh, consider that as a, an option, not put the second clip very close to the first clip. So you want to give yourself a little bit of a gap. It's a double breasted suturing. Right. Seems something similar, right? You know, yeah, yeah. You can see this, right? And uh, I, I find that whenever I'm dealing with the scar tissue and fibrosis, uh, that tissue tends to be very hard to close. And uh, in those cases, uh, I I try to prefer this clip uh, because this clip actually. Uh, I've not seen that uh, to bend. Uh, sometimes the, the, the wings can bend uh, the, and uh, it makes it harder for you. So as you can see, we're trying to close from um, the top end to the bottom end. And the other a trick that you want to keep in mind is when you're doing the type of uh, uh, closure, uh, make sure that you have uh, your colon decompressed uh, to keep your wound smaller uh, so that it allows you to close. So, so when I find it difficult to rotate the clip and then I use the resolution clip, the first set of clips are made by Microtech. So you know uh, what clips are being used. Uh, and as you can see here, I'm struggling to get in between. So in those cases, the resolution clip uh, actually makes it easier because it got a much finer controlled rotation. And you have to be very careful uh, in deploying the clip and uh, uh, here it's a little bit of a blind uh, deployment, as you can see, uh, because of the difficulty. And what happened was the clip actually did not go and reach the other side. So it was hung on one side and I felt that I should just remove it. And uh, I don't have to come out all the way. You can just uh, leave it there because it's not open. If it is wide open, uh, like a T-shape, uh, then I would actually come out. I don't want to leave a T-shirt clip 
especially in somebody who has diverticulosis because it can hung, get hung on those areas. Raja, I think that was actually um, kind of interesting that you demonstrated you, how easily you could actually pull that clip off, which sort of is a, a reminder to us why it's so important to have the clips, you know, um, really embedded. Right, right. The other thing is, you know, that would have made my job very difficult because it will be hanging in there. So I thought that uh, uh, I better take it off. Uh, and then uh, I came to the uh, uh, appendiceal side of the worn and I'm trying to get in between the two edges uh, and then try to close. So I left this thing and uh, for anyone you know uh, who has time and especially if they're interested, what I've done is I, I've uh, put this entire uh, video uh, on the YouTube uh, to just to get a feel for how do you resect or how do you do hot biopsy avulsion and how do you close a defect. So, so I would let, uh, let it run and maybe we could actually have some discussion. Uh, what are your Raj, thoughts, Roy? What I do, would you uh, agree that um the hot uh, biopsy avulsion technique should not be a primary technique uh, to cut uh, even a native lesion that looks like this. Um, the uh, hot avulsion is really uh, the last resort, so to speak. Uh, yes, I agree fully with that. I agree fully with that, Peter. And I think Sriram, Appreciate your thoughts on the uh, comments. Uh, you, you've got about more than two hours of anesthesia and lots of clips and expensive things. Is this, would it been about the same time, effort, and cost to just go to a laparoscopic surgery and take this down? Yeah, actually, Dr. Graham, I'm glad that you bring that up. Uh, what happened was, uh, you know, somebody who's healthy otherwise you know, uh, trying to uh, do a laparoscopic right hemicolectomy uh, would be simpler. And it's actually, it's uh, interesting that the referring gastroenterologist, you know, he, although he struggled to remove this polyp when he saw this woman in the clinic, uh, he laid out the game plan very clearly and I appreciated his beautiful note. And he actually commented that hey, you can actually have surgery here close to home. Uh, it will be one attempt and you don't have to worry about the polyp and you're done. Uh, versus, you know, if you go to some place and they will have, you know, it will be a little more complicated procedure. And uh, after the end of the procedure, uh, there is a chance that it may come back. It may requ require multiple procedures and at the end you may even require surgery. He actually laid out everything. And uh, this one, this uh, patient actually wanted to go this route. Uh, and uh, Raju, uh, Raju, that's, the uh, that's the, that is uh, the uh, thought process and uh, uh, that led to uh, doing this. And as you can, and see that, you know, we struggle, struggle, struggle. And uh, I feel that, you know, uh, one should not forget about the role of surgery and maybe it would be much easier to do, uh, especially when somebody is young and healthy uh, like this patient. Uh, Raju. But some patients would want to keep their column for whatever reason. Yes, right, sorry. I. Uh... I must say that I disagree uh, because uh, when you look at least in the uh, large studies of uh, uh, partial colectomy for uh, B9 uh, polyps, uh, there is still 
uh, a quite a significant uh, risk of mortality. I think the rate is actually 0.8%. Uh, so if you uh, round it up to just like 1%, that's like, uh, if it was you, if it was myself, uh, I wouldn't take a risk of 1% uh, if I can have this uh, done by uh, endoscopic means. Uh, and there's also a, a, a quite a lot of risk of morbidity. So um, uh, yeah, it, it becomes uh, riskless for us uh, because if somebody else is uh, doing the surgery, uh, but for the patient, uh, it's still a lot of risk. And if it happens to her, it's like a full uh, risk, a hundred percent risk. Uh, so uh, I, I wouldn't just say, oh yeah, the risk of uh, surgery is, is uh, negligible. I think surgery should be really reserved if it's like uh, something that's uh, malignant for sure, uh, or something that's completely impossible to be removed by an expert resectionist. But you know, you're still talking about you know maybe three hours of general anesthesia, which is where the one of the major parts where the risk comes from. Less maybe at MD Anderson, but in my hospital, it would be the anesthesia would be. A significant part of the risk, uh -huh. but uh, you would have the same risk for for that for the surgery, right? Exactly. I'm, I I think uh, what we are talking about the risk on. But on if she the, fails, if she fails, she's gonna you know they then still need the surgery. I think uh, I I agree on that, uh, but uh, Dr. Graham, I think uh, uh, the other thing is uh, um, the one thing that uh, I. Uh, always promise my patient before uh, I start the procedure is that I said, look, if I think I cannot cut it, I wouldn't even start it. Uh, I, uh, you know, and uh, it's, I think Raju has the same uh, principle. And then uh, I think uh, he also says, okay, this is going to be hard. I'm going to spend the time, but I know that at the end, it is most likely than not that, more likely than not that it will be successful. Well, the key is the patient got a good uh, choice. You know, they were told yeah. what, and, and they made the decision. And that, that's what really is the most important thing. Right. Yeah, agreed, uh, agreed. Dr. Graham, I'm glad that you, you bring that important point. I think it's very important for uh, the trainees to learn, uh, especially, uh, to put all the cards on the table. I think it's very important for the patient to know. And the second one is for the trainees, you know, you, you may be starting now, uh, but as you go, all, go along, you should be able to share your own track record with the patient. It's not about what is published in the literature, you know, what you and your team can provide to a particular patient. That is very important. And uh, that's what I actually keep uh, sharing with my own colleagues, you know, showcase your own track record and put it out there uh, so that the patient can make a decision. And, uh, and we all improve with time. So, but I think it's very important to share that. Even more important is the person that did it the first time should have known that, that, that was out beyond their capability and they should have referred at that point. Actually, it's very interesting, you know, the, uh, uh, this is a picture that I posted here and uh, uh, she's in the recovery area. Uh, the patient actually told me, uh, Dr. Raju, I have this uh, picture uh, that I pulled out from my records and I brought it and uh, uh, this was in the recovery area after the EMR, and I was thinking that this polyp was already removed, and uh, this was back in 2012. So uh, you can see that, right? You know, this is a polyp uh, that was there and uh, probably grew. Uh, fortunately, it didn't turn out to, uh, to, did not go into cancer. So. Raju? Yeah. Sorry if I missed it, but what was the pathology? Tubular adenoma. Okay. Yeah. So there, Zabir has a question in the chat, especially seeing how, um, you know, kind of indolent it's been, this lesion from 2012 to 2021. Mm -hmm. 
um, if, if the patient is older or has multiple comorbidities, mm -hmm. instead of surgery versus um, colonoscopy and EMR, can they opt for not doing any procedures and just leave right. it alone? Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that uh, uh, it's, a, it's not an easy call to make. Uh, when you see somebody where you expect their lifespan is going to be limited, right? You know, mm -hmm. uh, a few years, uh, maybe three to four, five years, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, when I see somebody like that, you know, somebody coming in a wheelchair, had a stroke on two or three uh, antithrombotic medications and mm -hmm. uh, they need help, they may not be able to do the prep properly, all those things, right? You get those signs when you're taking the history. Mm -hmm. I try to share that uh, information with them. And uh, in my last 10 years, I probably had about four or five patients where I said it's not worth it. And, uh, and fortunately, you know, whenever somebody uh, passes off, uh, you get uh, the information, right? And they pick, you get an information that your patient uh, died or whatever. And mm -hmm. uh, when I look back at those are four or five patients, I think mm -hmm. uh, we made the right decision of not putting them through a procedure and uh, they, they would die from other comorbid uh, illnesses. So something to keep in mind. But when you do that, uh, whenever you decide not to offer something, uh, you make it a point to get the input or take the benefit of the wisdom of the crowd, uh, you know, in a... In any practice, you'll have surgeons and other colleagues to have a multidisciplinary conference and get an internist to evaluate the risks for that particular procedure and present that information to the patient. And that's what is important. And uh, that's what I do, you know. Uh, when I decide not to do, I make sure that I get the input so that the patient and the family knows that uh, we are not just uh, shooting from hip, but we are getting the input from other experts in the field. May I have a short comment to Selvi's question? I think this is a very intriguing uh, question indeed in a patient who is um, 80 plus has a lot of comorbidities and the patient opt not to have any intervention. Um, I think um, the opposite is we have seen probably all of us a patient who despite all these conditions comes back in five years with a cancer <laughs> so the take-home message would be to document very carefully and this is what the training is to document careful carefully that the patient's wish was not to intervene either endoscopically or surgical um, intervention Documentation is key in this case. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, Sylvia. Agreed, yeah. All right. So, Sriram, any other? Sriram, any thoughts? No, I was just following the conversation. There are, uh, all I can say is that uh, as much as it is important to put all the cards on the table, I think it is also important to take some of the cards out of the table having put them on. <laughs> yeah. And where it mean, what it means is that uh, uh, one of them will be the 80-year-old or the comorbidities or the, or the availability of surgery or my own ability to do the procedure. And if I if I'm not willing to do the procedure, if I, whether I know if it can be done and if there is somebody nearby where they can be sent, yeah. All these factors, I think, uh, come to come in uh, come in the picture because this is off the books. Whatever we are doing mm -hmm. is, uh, uh, is is so highly individualized in terms of the abilities that it is not uh, it cannot be peddled as standard of care, and that is the reason why all these conversations and documentation. I just want to uh, thank you, Sri Ram. I want to make a couple of comments. Uh, for the sake of trainees, you, it's not about resection. I think it's very important that you understand that you are responsible for the total care of that patient. And uh, by the time we finished this procedure, it was about six, uh, six o'clock. Uh, you know that the patient is already fasting for almost uh, 48 hours, right? And uh, 
So one thing that I did, and she was about to travel to travel back home for another two hours. So our son was uh, not at a bedside given the COVID. Uh, uh, I kept him informed uh, throughout the procedure. Uh, before the procedure, I called the son uh, with the patient uh, in front of the patient and the patient would listen to my conversation on the speakerphone. So it's important to keep the conversation going to make them comfortable. I think it's very important. And then uh, one hour into the procedure, we made a phone call to the patient's uh, son to let him know where we are and in terms of the procedure and then at the end of the procedure. And because it happened late, usually when patients go through two hours of anesthesia, you don't think that, you know, despite propofol, they're going to be up and about, they're not. And when they go home, they may not hydrate themselves. So one thing we did was we gave another uh, two liters of fluid to hydrate them uh, before they left, uh, because that's very important to, uh, uh, to keep them hydrated so that they don't get into trouble. And I called the uh, referring gastroenterologist and uh, talked to him. Uh, and he was a little bit uh, uh, disappointed. And he said, you know, I wish I didn't uh, make it difficult for you. Uh, but I shared what I did. And uh, I told him that I'm worried that she may have a delayed bleeding. So uh, he was aware of that. And I called her the next day uh, to make sure that she was doing well. And then with the biopsy result. So, and we're going to bring her back in six months. And I want to share that result with you uh, because it's important to have the follow-up and not just you know, cutting the poly, but what happened to the patient. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. I uh, hope you all have a great uh, uh, weekend. And a happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Raju. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, everyone. Take care.